Associate in the Department of Forest Ecosystems and Society at OSU. He's a landscape forest ecologist. He's interested in how climate change and disturbance influence ecosystem dynamics over space and time. Carol's PhD research focused on tree invasion of subalpine sub parklands in the Oregon Cascades. In addition, he studied tree invasion and meadow decline in the Coast Range, tree line responses to climate change in interior Alaska, and how thinning and prescribed burning can be used to restore historic forest composition and structure in mixed conifer forests of the California Sierra Nevada. Okay, uh, move away from glaciers and skiers and knuckle draggers and indoor skiers, which is right there. Um, and so I want to talk about uh, specifically plants. I'm looking at alpine, subalpine vegetation, uh, tree invasion, climate change here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I just want to start this off by, uh, I'm biased here, I think there are some things that are the iconic features of this region. Uh, not a big surprise, we have a great coast, uh, lots of people come see waterfalls, I really can't talk about the Pacific Northwest without talking about the forest, and um, I'd argue high elevation areas as well, are right in that list of things people think of about the Pacific Northwest. And so now I want to just kind of take a step back. I'm not sure how well people can see this in the back. We have Oregon and Washington. The red areas are kind of the back of the envelope. Here's where alpine vegetation is. So this is not glaciers. Um, this is where we're high elevation, we're above the trees, but there's still plants, there's alpine plants. I wouldn't sweat these numbers because this is really back in the envelope, but alpine areas are not that abundant. Uh, more so in Washington, uh, they have more elevation, it's farther north. Uh, but especially here in Oregon, we have some great alpine areas, uh, but pretty small. Uh, one could argue, though, that we're fortunate and not they're very protected. Uh, so the red areas are alpine, <coughs> the dark green is national parks, the light green is federal wilderness areas and forest service wilderness. And you can see pretty clearly here, almost all of the alpine is in some form of federal protection. I had a question mark there, which I think will become apparent at the end of this talk. Um, when we think of wilderness, often when we think of alpine, there's a misconception of stability and, and protection. Uh, one thing, certainly from talking about glaciers and mass balance, uh, stability is not the name of the game. Uh, regionally, we have trees invading high elevation areas. Uh, since the early 1970s, uh, certainly I've known from multiple studies, we have trees that are invading these areas. Um, we have glaciers that are shrinking, but I'm going to focus on tree invasion. And this regional story is also a global story. Well, oh, maybe I want to not talk about the global story just yet. Uh, first, I guess I should talk about why should we care about tree invasion. Um, in a nutshell, high elevations and high latitudes, alpine areas, arctic areas, all by default have a sensitivity to climate change, just because they're areas that we expect greater changes in things like temperature or snowfall. On top of that, with tree invasion, we have some, in some areas, some serious biodiversity concerns going forward. This example is just kind of generic <coughs> alpine meadow. We have some nice lupins right here. You can see some big trees here. And you can see these smaller trees right here that have invaded. These here are 35-year-old trees that have invaded. Uh, the alpine plants can't compete under the shade of trees that then come in. They can't compete up with the shade of the forest. So if you get a lot of tree invasion, you have more populations of species that are not going to compete in that environment. And it's not just plants. A lot of insects have very species-specific requirements. If those alpine plants aren't there, those insects that require them won't be here. Um, the other point I wanted to make about why to care, we should care about tree invasion, when we think about climate change, a lot of times we talk about greenhouse gases and the trapping of energy in the atmosphere. But we also have a process going on the surface of the Earth. You think about if you have a white car and a black car out in the sun in the middle of the summer. The white car is alpine covered in snow. The black car is this dark conifer forest. 
One of them reflects a lot of radiation and one absorbs a lot of radiation. So you're changing the surface energy balance. Now, I want to talk a little bit. Um, I kind of like this picture. This is a meta-analysis of about 160 tree invasion studies. And the main thing to think of here is all the black dots, which are about half of them, are documented tree invasion. So tree line moving up, trees establishing in alpine areas. The other half, no change. So what it's saying is that there's trees invading in all these areas. It's a global eco ecological phenomenon going on across climate regions, different species, different land systems. And the global story is this is happening because of increase in temperatures. But you really want to hesitate when you talk about that global synthesis, that global story. You can't just drop it down on a local or regional story. Um, so the rest of what I want to talk about today is the local story, specifically a place called Jefferson Park. Just out of curiosity, how many people here have been to Jefferson Park? Okay, so that's enough that's really good, but I don't want anyone else to go there. Um, <laughs> because it's a really beautiful place. Um, so Jefferson Park, right here in Oregon. Uh, here's a close-up up here. This is Mount Jefferson. Jefferson Park is just above it. Uh, here's a zoom-in of this basin uh, that's created by glacial advancing retreat. It's got some nice lakes. You can see these dark areas. These are islands of trees. Well, uh, these lighter areas are meadows. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see this in the back, but there's these red outlines. And these are debris flows. And these will become important when I'm talking about climate change and tree invasion. So obviously, for the people who have been there, it's a great place. Uh, beautiful views of Mount Jefferson. You can see here's Jefferson Park right here. Uh, this is taken right on the Pacific Crest Trail. So very popular. Uh, backpacking and recreation area. It's a great place to take a nap, uh, at least in the summer. And then obviously it has uh, just amazing subalpine meadows, lots of wildflowers. Um, what more can I say here? Uh, what I really want to know about Jefferson Park is know this one small area in detail. Uh, you know, a lot of different pieces of data to bring together to understand that. But it really boils down to, I want to know, uh, how has tree invasion occurred over space and time in this one place? And what's, kind of, what's the underlying factor or factors driving these patterns? And so a bunch of different chunks of data to look at this. Um, you want to know about tree invasion. You want to know when did the trees invade. So you need tree cores, core trees, uh, age them. I have this little example here. I was trying to find one that was as old as I am. So this is about the size of one of my fingers. Um, that's 46 years old. So it was older than me, at least it was. Um, other things I want to look at is topography and vegetation, the surface of the earth. Um, you get at all kinds of cool high-tech ways. Uh, earlier, LIDAR was mentioned, which is basically laser beams shot down from an aircraft. And we get these incredibly detailed uh, visualizations of topography, the surface of the Earth, and vegetation structure. So here, this is from Jefferson Park. You have these low areas, and then there's high areas, and here's the trees on the high areas. Alpine areas have snow, subalpine areas have snow, mm -hmm. so a uh, bunch of snow surveys. Uh, this was in late July. So not exactly what you think of about Oregon in late July. Um, and then, just to top up, regional climate. So trying to tie all these different things in. Obviously, don't sweat what's on there. All it is showing is an example of some climate data of increasing temperatures and decreasing snowfall over the past 50 years. So I will have some graphs here. I'm going to try to keep them to a minimum and not bog down in data. Um, starting to look first at tree invasion over time. All this is is showing counts of the birthdays of trees, so those cores. Um, 
And from that, you can figure out, if you do it right, the area of these places, like Jefferson Park, that have been invaded over time. And so this is just from one slice of Jefferson Park showing uh, basically a rapid increase in tree invasion. From 8% of this area occupied by trees in 1950 up to a little over a third by 2007. Um, when I first talked about Jefferson Park, I mentioned this idea of debris flows. And this is why I mentioned they are really important. Um, these debris flows, uh, the main one occurred in the 1930s, have had massive invasion over the past 50 years, but double the rate is on the glacial landforms. Uh, not really clear why. Uh, you can look at invasion rates, and on the, on the glacial landforms, snow is the single most important factor, not temperature. More snow, less invasion. Less snow, more invasion. I will have to show one other graph. Um, Again, just to make that point, more snow, less invasion. Uh, but the debris flows with this really rapid tree invasion, it's not correlated to snow. So why is that? Um, it's not really clear. Is it decoupled from climate? Has some threshold been reached where this relationship doesn't work anymore? Not clear. The only thing that's clear is that this is context dependent, the sensitivity of the system to climate change depends on this context. And this spills over into tree invasion over space as well. Uh, not a big surprise given the importance of snow over time, the spatial patterns of snow depth in the summer also influence where the trees invade. So this example here you probably can't see it that well. This area is actually a depression. Uh, there's a meadow here. There's no trees. Tons of snow. On these ridge tops, there's no snow. There's plenty of trees. The inception, and it'll be clear in the next photo, is this big area here is all a debris flow. And much less snow on it. So there's all these interactions going on that influence where is the snow in space topography, so a ridge top of less snow. And if there's existing trees somewhere, that also has the same effect, it reduces snow. And the result is very different spatial patterns. This is the glacial landform here. You can see it's the trees are clustered. Here's that debris flow. It's this nice smooth green, <coughs> the wall of the young hemlock. You can look at it in a really high-tech way with LiDAR. Uh, same thing, here's these little ridges. There's less snow here, trees grow. Wet areas down here, these depressions, snow stays there, trees aren't there. Down here, debris flow, it's nice and flat, and all that fuzz is tree invasion. And that's what the tree invasion looks like on the debris flows. And so you get two extremes, that debris flow Big change, like from it was just no vegetation in 1930 to what will become just a wall of mountain hemlock as it is now and will be going in the future. Instead, on a glacial landform, very different. Here's these pockets of tree invasion, but then you have this wet kind of depression right here that resists tree invasion, even during periods of climate with low snow. So. Where are we going in the future, regionally, with tree invasion? Um, so globally, tree invasion is being driven largely by temperature. But I would argue that in the Pacific Northwest, our, our tree invasion is unique to this region. The maritime climate that we have, moderated <coughs> climate, a very deep snowpack at high elevation, creates a system that's much more dependent on snow uh, than temperature, even though obviously the two are intertwine. Uh, you can look at regional models going into the future who suggest that there's pretty modest increases in temperature, but we expect fairly significant decreases in snow. And so unless you understand that relationship of what, the, what environmental factors are driving change, uh, just from temperature alone, we think, oh, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. 
but it's that change in snow that's really going to be the kicker for future tree damage. Um, obviously, I've said this once or twice, but context really matters. There's a variety of things that influence tree invasion in these systems at multiple spatial scales, multiple temporal scales as well. Um, but on the spatial, we have these debris flows, which are going to probably become more common in the future. As glaciers, if we have more group glaciers melting, it creates more instability on the steep slopes and the cascades, which has more potential for debris flow hazard. The flip side of that, though, is those wet meadows that resist tree invasion could be micro refugia for a lot of species. They could be very resistant to tree invasion going into the future, even if the larger system is under a very unfavorable climate. So I wanted to wrap this up with coming back to wilderness, because I started with this idea of alpine being protected. Um, we really, in the region, have this benefit of some nice, large wilderness areas that are interconnected. And, and that's unquestionably a good thing. Uh, we have interconnected, diverse ecosystems. Uh, there's opportunities for different ecosystem configurations, opportunities for migration of organisms. Uh, no question that's good for resilience and adaptation to climate change. But clearly, climate change doesn't stop or acknowledge wilderness boundaries. Um, I think this brings up some philosophical and legal questions or dilemmas when we think about these systems and climate change. Uh, three pretty easy ones off the top of my head. People talk about assisted migration, moving plant species from one place to another. We're talking about alpine areas, we're talking about moving them in congressionally designated wilderness. Is that legit? Is that going to you know, make it through a lawsuit? Is that morally acceptable? Uh, maybe. One that's probably not is tree removal. Let's say we have alpine meadows with some very high risk endangered species. Trees are invading it. We could easily, in the short term, try to maintain those species by cutting out some of the trees that are invaded. Is that going to fly? Doubtful. And then finally, being a researcher and wanting to do research, one of the big questions in these systems is we can look retrospectively, but in order to know what's going to happen in the future, the best way to know is to experimentally force future, future climate conditions on experimental units now. Well, that means setting up infrastructure in wilderness areas. There might be a few places that are not in wilderness in Alpine where we can do that, but there's very few. So especially after yesterday's keynote, I think this kind of boils down to me that if I'm thinking about how we view alpine areas and tree invasion and climate change, I think it really boils down to does climate change impose our will, society's will, uh, on alpine wilderness areas, on those ecosystems, on those organisms? And if it does, it calls into question you know, how we view these systems in the future. So that's it. Thank you.